you know, we kind of jokingly said we'd, we'd uh, weld Mickey Mouse ears onto the top of it if that's what the customer wants, which really developed our new motto. And that was the answer is yes. What's the question? Hi, this is Tim Heston, Senior Editor at The Fabricator Magazine. And thank you so much for joining us for this first episode of Automation Talk, a new video series presented by FMA in partnership with Salvagnini America. For this first episode, we've reached out to Randy Harid, founder of Kendall Howard, a unique company northeast of Minneapolis. He founded Kendall Howard as a product company, specifically in networking racks and other technology products, but it has evolved into a dynamic organization with the, its fastest growing division in custom fabrication. But it's not just typical custom fab, it's cradle to grave product development, product manufacturing, product marketing, and product delivery. Uh, it's a unique business model and the cornerstone to it all has been automation. I'll hand it over to Randy, who will tell you the rest of the story. You know, it was a little bit of tenacity and some good advice from a lot of good people. Uh, but I decided to start a product company and that product company was in what I knew, which was technology, uh, racking systems, anything to do with, you know, metal, woods, productivity. Early on in Kendall Howard, we decided that, you know, we really needed to do everything ourselves. We couldn't outsource anything. We'll outsource everything in the beginning, but at, at, at some point we had to take it all over. So we bought our first turret and we didn't buy an automated turret, which was a mistake, but we, you know, it's a manual, a manual turret like most people have. Um, looking back on it now, I wish I would have put some automation on it. We bought our first brake press. Um, that, I think those two machines lasted maybe a few months before we'd maxed them out. So we bought another brake press and then that led to our first laser we ended up purchasing a L1 Salvanini laser, which was, as I believe, the fourth fiber optic laser ever put in the country by anybody. So this was, pardon the pun, super cutting edge back then. Mm -hmm. And we just loved the auto, and we bought full automation for it. So it was load 22,000 pounds of steel into one end, parts came out the other end. And no human person touched anything till it was done. And that was really an eye-opening experience to how we wanted to build the rest of the company. The final step for us in the sheet metal industry was when we purchased our panel bender. So the Salvanini panel bender, I had wanted to buy for several years, but I could never really get past the cost versus production and I couldn't get there as far as ROI. But I think I was leaving a lot of intangibles out that this gave us it gave us things that i never thought about before was you know it can't just be for extra production what else can you do with it and so it, it offered us manufacturing capabilities that we didn't have with our current machines that were able to do things that that i couldn't get out of a normal press break so everything about our company in the last you know 10 years has been about that theory put raw material in one side and try to get a part out the other side so that we We've had growth, you know, exponential growth over the years, and we haven't had exponential hiring because we've been trying to continue to automate, 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 automate. And, and every piece of automation we bring in, I mean, we bought our first robotic, fully robotic welding cell probably 15 years ago and never looked back. Um, and that's the kind of thing that helps us compete with the overseas that you just, you can't do on a manual machine. We don't really like to look at ourselves as a contract manufacturer. We're certainly not a job shop. I mean, we, we set up the company to be a product company. So we have a marketing department, we have copywriters, we have a full sales staff, an engineering staff, prototypers, machinists, designers, packaging designers, I mean, you name it. Everything you need to build a product and market it, we had to bring inside. And so over time, we built that full company up. Um, many years ago, we had a couple of customers that said, hey, you know, I love this thing you make, but if it could only do this, and no, we go to other companies and they won't customize it. And we said, well, yeah, why wouldn't we do that? So we started making some custom products and we, you know, we kind of jokingly said we'd, we'd uh, weld Mickey Mouse ears onto the top of it if that's what the customer wants, which really developed our new motto. And that was the answer is yes, what's the question? So we decided a long time ago that the customer's desire to have something that didn't exist overweighed our desire to make 
a standard margin on a standard product, making it thousands of times a day because that loyalty that you get with a customer comes back tenfold. Then a customer a while later came back and said, hey, you know what, I'm a, I'm a newer customer. I wanna have this product line. I wanna, I wanna bring it to market, but I don't know what to do. So we said, well, well, we'll make it for you and we'll put it in the box because that's really what we're known for is you know taking an idea and putting it in a box and shipping it to your customer. If you want somebody to make your custom brackets, go to a job shop, that's not us. If you want somebody to make that bracket set for something very specific, put it in a custom box, put instructions in it that we wrote and do your marketing material for you, a web banner, your photos, all of that stuff because we have that infrastructure already. So why wouldn't we sell that as a value add? Now, it's definitely a different strategy and it, it was some growing pains in the first few years, but now we're at the point where somebody can say, hey, I want this widget and this widget, you know, needs to go to, my goal is to sell 100,000 units to these types of, pl of places. What do I do now? Well, they don't have to have a plant. We already have it. They don't have to have a marketing department. We have it. We don't have, have to do photography. We have a studio video studio in-house and we do all digital rendering. So we don't even need the, the photography anymore. So we really can provide them the same thing we were already doing for ourselves. So it was really just a, sh it wasn't necessarily a shifting in, in how we do things. It was a shifting in who we do it for. Right, and that's, right. we just would build on what we already had to offer the same thing to a customer. Yeah, what are the next steps for you? Where, where do you see uh, your next steps in your automation journey going in the next three to five years? I think, the next big automation step for us is going to be in the finishing world. And what we want to see is the ability to take parts directly out of departments and more or less put them on a conveyor or an overhead hook system or something and have that go directly into some type of automated finishing booth. So rather than, you know, putting 200 parts on a pallet, walking them over to to a, a, a powder coating area and, and going through and, and painting those and then taking them off and putting them on a pallet then putting them back. It's just, a, there's a lot of movement steps there. And so what we're really trying to do is take the steps away. So if we're working on a design right now for another new build, we just built the new building, we're already in it and it's just about full. So our third building design that we're looking at is to be able to help with that final finish automation of how do we go from a part fresh off the brake press, fresh out of spot welding, fresh out of wherever, put it on a hook, and when it comes off the hook, it's finished and ready for final assembly. That dream he has of finishing, of parts emerging from a machine, hanging it on a hook, being conveyed automatically to the final assembly. That is an extraordinarily uh, progressive view of the finishing operation and how it could be integrated within other elements of the operation to keep parts on the move, to minimize human touches throughout the whole facility, and to restructure the entire facility again around that automation cornerstone. And it's this kind of progressive thinking that we plan to feature in future episodes of, of, of Automation Talk. So I hope you'll join us then. But for now, thank you. On behalf of FMA and Salvagnini America, we'll see you next time.